Hey guys, your host, Avery Carl with The Short Term Shop here. Welcome to our 10 episode deep dive on the Sarasota and Bradenton area, which includes all those fun barrier islands like Anna Maria Island, Siesta Key, really the West Coast of Florida. And if you guys are ready to start buying in this market, email us at agents at the shop.com and we will connect you with our expert agents in this market. I also wanted to let you know that we have some supplemental materials for you guys available on our website. It's the shorttermshop.com where you can go and you can set up a search and look at properties, see what the purchase prices are in this market currently. And you can save your search so that when a property that hits the market in your price range comes out, we can email you and then you'll know right away. We've also got the AirDNA data, thanks to our friends over at AirDNA, for this market for the past few years to help you gauge what a property should be able to do. We've got a pretty cool calculator on the website also to help you tie everything together. So lots of stuff to help you along your way while you're listening to this podcast or and or if you just want to hang out with us more, that's pretty cool because we want to hang out with you too. And there's one good place you can do that. It is our Facebook group, same title as my book. It's called Short Term Rental, Long Term Wealth. It's just us and 60,000 of our closest friends hanging out, talking about short-term rentals, sharing best practices, and all that stuff. So you can join that, or if you guys really just wanna talk to us directly, if you have questions about short-term rentals, we have an open office hours call every Thursday, and you can sign up for that at strquestions.com. Now let's get to the episode. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Short Term Show special episode series on the Sarasota Bradenton market. Again, we've got John and Christina here to help. We also have Jennifer Winkler. Jennifer, you want to introduce yourself really quick and tell everybody what you do and who you're with? Sure. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Jennifer Winkler. I'm the agency owner for the People's Insurance Agency. We've got three locations in Florida, Sarasota, Bradenton, and over on the East Coast in Margate. Uh, We specialize in property and casualty, so homeowners, flood insurance, car insurance, commercial products, um, property and casualty mainly. But we love what we do. Awesome. Well, thank you. not glamorous or sexy, but somebody does it, right? (laughs) Right, right. Well, thanks so much for being on, and we are going to spend some time with you towards the end of the show, so definitely appreciate it. But today we're talking about expenses, so we're just going to kind of roll through a few of the, or not a few, all of the expenses uh, that you have when you're running a short-term rental in this market. So first, let's start with the basics. So let's talk about your basic utilities like your electric, your internet, your water, What are we typically seeing for those and how does somebody figure out how they should run a pro forma uh, or figure out what their expenses are for their pro forma if they haven't bought yet? Sure. I can kind of go over that. Um, Obviously, there's going to be variables, you know, age of the home, size of the home, but to kind of go through the list and just give you some some ballpark numbers. um, On average, electric usually runs about $350 to $400 a month, and that includes pool heat. Um, during the summertime, you'll spend more on your air conditioner than you will on the electricity for the pool heat. And then in the wintertime, it's flip-flop. Your pool heater will be running more frequently than your air conditioner will. But over the 12 months, it averages out to about $350 to $400 a month. And that's for a uh, 2,000 square foot, you know, three, four bedroom home. Um, water averages about maybe $100 to $125 a month uh, for two to three bathrooms. Um, internet, you know, if you're just offering basic, uh, internet service without any cable packages, you know, that's around $85 a month for basic internet service. Um, lawn care is one that you got to account for. Lawn care usually runs about $150 a month. Um, pool service at all of our properties, we do twice a week pool service to make sure our pools are in top-notch condition, um, at all times. So twice a week pool service usually runs about $220 a month. Um, In Florida, we do have a lot of bugs. So pest control is a very important thing that you need to account for. Um, We do a quarterly service uh, and it runs about $45 a month. If at any time there is some activity, you know, guest notice, some ants or something like that, we can call them back out there at no additional charge, which is nice. Um, Supplies, uh, toilet paper, paper towels, things like that. Uh, we budget about 100 bucks a month for. Um, that's just kind of, you know, from our experience, what we've seen is a pretty good estimate. Um, and then if we want to get into 
maintenance, um, you know, capital expenditures. Um, that's going to vary depending on the age of the home, um, you know, how good a condition it is. But, you know, two to three percent of revenue is usually a, a pretty safe number that a lot of people use. Dang, John came prepared. He had everything. <laughs> Okay. So that, um, that, I mean, that covers basically all of the basic stuff. Sorry for saying basic so much. Uh, do you guys have a lot of gas there, uh, like gas ranges or anything like that? Very, very limited. Um, it, it's not super common, you know, um, particularly in vacation rentals. Uh, for people who do have gas uh, pool heaters, um, they usually get rid of those and go with uh, an electric heat pump just because, you know, a gas pool heater is about four to five times as expensive to run. Good to know. So let's talk about internet. So about how much do you guys pay for internet? I know you went through there in that very about, expensive and well-prepared month. About 85 bucks a month, maybe a hundred bucks a month. Okay. That's not too bad. So let's talk about, you talked a little bit about how much you budget for supplies a month. That's about how much I budget also. So I kind of want to segue that into cleaners and what they typically charge and what's included in that. So can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, cleaners will vary their price point, but, you know, I definitely don't look for the cheapest cleaner considering the cleaner is probably the most important person in your, uh, in your team. Um, I estimate cleaning, I estimate cleaning fees at about 14 cents a square foot. And to give you an idea of what that breaks out to, um, for example, I have a three bedroom, two bath house. That's about 1500 square feet. And that's about $225, uh, to clean that property. For a 2,000 square foot 4.2, comes out to about $275. And for a 2,800 square foot 5.3, I'm paying about $375. Um, and that includes, uh, you know, some of the supplies. You know, it'll include um, the soaps. It'll include the toilet paper. It'll include the paper towels. Um, some cleaners will supply it for those prices. Some cleaners won't, you know, and then you'll have to pay on top of that. So it really depends on your specific cleaner, but those are kind of some ballpark estimates. Yeah. So do they, you are, so the stuff that they don't provide and some cleaners do and some cleaners don't, and you're typically your price per clean will be different based on this. So you're doing your own toilet paper and paper towels and stuff and just Amazoning it to your cleaner. How do you get those to them? Um, at, at, at different properties, I'm doing it different ways. You know, at some properties where the cleaners provide it, um, I just give them an extra, you know, $15, $20 a clean and they just handle the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, with other properties, with other cleaners, um, you know, I'll have my QC person, I'll have everything shipped to their house. And then when they're doing their quality control inspections, they'll make sure that everything is restocked and, you know, there's plenty of material there for the next clean. So it varies depending on the cleaner. Gotcha. And do your cleaners provide linens or do you do your own for the beds? I try to keep all the linens at the house. I try to provide all of my own linens. However, you know, I do have a property that's a six bedroom property. It has 12 different beds um, and laundry is just not you just can't do all the laundry in the given time for a same day turnover. Mm -hmm. So with that property, you know, the cleaning team does have a linen service to where they provide a full change out of linens, you know, for an additional fee. Gotcha. And that's what I was going to ask is, does the cleaning fee include them washing everything or is that an additional? It includes them washing everything, but it doesn't include a, a change out of linens, you know, like them bringing linens from a, an outside facility. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Uh, do, do your cleaners do light maintenance, like light bulb changing and air filter changing, or is that a different person? Um, it's usually a different person. Some will, though. Um, others don't want anything to do with it. Again, it's kind of a cleaner specific. Sometimes you have a cleaner that partners with like a handyman or a cleaner who works with their husband or boyfriend who kind of does handyman stuff, light maintenance type stuff. Um so, you know, we see a range of it in the market. It all depends on what cleaner you wind up working with. All right. I think that's a pretty good, you know, high level view. So let's move on to something that is a little more, uh, less fun to talk about. Uh, let's talk about taxes. So what taxes are we having to pay on our property? First, let's talk about property tax, and then we'll talk about the running a short-term rental tax. So what's the property tax typically in Florida? So obviously, when you buy a property, the taxes are probably going to be a little bit lower than they than what they will be on um, the next the next uh, calendar year after that property value resets. 
Um, so you never want to count on what that current tax rate is uh, when you're budgeting future years. What I tell clients is, you know, either go to the local tax collector or just to use a good rule of thumb, I budget 1% of the purchase price. So it's a $500,000 home, you know, estimate your taxes to be $5,000 a year. And again, I'm not a tax advisor or anything in that means, but, you know, that's the rule of thumb I personally use. I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb. So let's talk about now the taxes that are a cost of running a short-term rental. So sales tax and occupancy tax. So what are those and do they differ by the different little areas that are all around in your market? So they do. So um, right off the bat, uh, Florida Department of Revenue gets 7%. So uh, it's 6% sales and 1% discretionary sales or whatever the, the breakdown is, but it's a total of 7% that goes to the Florida Department of Revenue. Um, beyond that, each county has a tourist development tax. In Manatee County, it's 5%, uh, where Bradenton is located. In Sarasota County and Pinellas County, it's 6%. Uh, so there is a difference um, depending on the county. Um, in Sarasota County, Sarasota has an agreement with Airbnb and VRBO where they automatically remit those taxes for you. So you don't have to remit them yourselves if you're booking only on Airbnb and VRBO. If you're taking direct bookings or using another uh, platform outside of Airbnb and VRBO, then you would have to remit those yourself. But if you're just doing Airbnb and VRBO in Sarasota, they handle all of it for you, which is nice. In Manatee County and Pinellas County, um, you have to register with the county tax collector, um, set up an account and pay that yourself. Um, but they are usually very helpful and make it very easy to take your money. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Okay. So I think that covers taxes. Um, typically, guys, your property tax will be escrowed into your mortgage payment, or at least that's how we do all of ours. So it's not like a, oh yeah, I just got hit with a $5,000 property tax bill. We we keep that escrowed into our mortgage. So it it's not as big of a shock every time. And we do that in all, all the markets that we own in all the states we own in. Um, and that's what most uh, lenders are going to have it set up as. So just make sure you're paying attention to that. You don't want to get in a situation where you think it's escrowed and it's not. And then all of a sudden you haven't paid your taxes. <laughs> Nobody wants to be in that situation. <laughs> all right. So the elephant in the room with Florida expenses is insurance. So insurance in Florida is a little on the tough side right now. So I'm hoping that Jen can kind of explain to us what that landscape is looking like currently and maybe what, not what the future holds because nobody can know, but is there anything being worked on to kind of mitigate what's going on with it? Well, it's actually pretty exciting. We had some positive legislative reform happen earlier this year. So there is some hope and there is some positive, there, I'm hopeful next year is going to be a great year for us. And I'll give you a couple of great examples of of what our landscape looked like and why we had so many markets leave and what um, what happened in um, Tallahassee that's going to make things better going forward. And I'll break it down and I'll make it really simple and not overcomplicated. Um, the first one, uh, roof. There's tons of roof fraud going, roofing fraud going on in the state of Florida. And I'll give you an example. Average shingle roof. There's different types of roofs, but the most popular is shingle. In Florida, a shingle roof lasts about 15 years. Maybe if you're really lucky and you've got a big oak tree that shades it, <laughs> you might get 20 years out of a shingle roof. But for the most part, a shingle roof is going to last 15 to 20 years. Well, about a year ago, we had rampant roofing fraud going on where roofers would knock on people's doors that had a 20 year shingle roof and say, hey, we're going to replace this roof for you for free. And we're just going to send the bill to the insurance. We're going to pad your deductible. So you won't even get it. You won't even have to cover your deductible. We're going to give you a free TV. And if you tell a neighbor, we're going to give you $500. But we're just going to tell the insurance company that three years ago, your roof was damaged from a storm. So we're going to claim it hurricane from three years ago. And we're just going to send the bill to the insurance company. Well, roofs are kind of like, it's, it's a wear and tear item. For example, on your car, when your tires go bald, do you call your auto insurance company and say, hey, my tires are bald, you need to replace them? No, it's a wear and tear item. Well, roofs in Florida are a wear and tear item. So when they meet that life expectancy, that's a home maintenance thing. It's not, hey, call my insurance company and say it's from damage three years ago. Well, what happened is this caught on like wildfire, wildfire and people were getting free roofs. 
a lot of people got arrested. A lot of people still haven't had insurance claims paid, but a lot of roofs were paid. And those insurance companies have decided, we don't want to play in Florida anymore. See you later. Bye. We've lost, gosh, 30 different insurance companies that said, see you. Bye. We're out of here. Huge companies that have been here for a hundred plus years. So with that, the, then you're, you're, you know, the amount of insurance companies you have have just dwindled down to nothing. And the ones that are left are at capacity. So that caused people calling around and not even being able to get insurance or the rates are so high. So one of the cool things, the positive legislative reform that came from that is one is now if you have a wind related claim, you have to report it within one year, not three years. So insurance companies can budget a little better when there's an event, they can sort of budget how many roofs in a particular area might have been impacted. So that's the one great thing. The second thing is, um, I was telling you how roofs are like a wear and tear item. So now uh, carriers are able to put policy language in there that says, hey, their roofs are treated more of like an ACV, actual cash value item, versus a full replacement. Hey, your roof's 20 years old. Yeah, you're right. Let's just go in and put a new roof on your on on your house. It's more they're going to now be depreciated. So with that, with those two things, which are huge, insurance companies and reinsurers feel comfortable doing business in the state of Florida again. So there's been a lot of filings, a lot of companies saying, okay, we want to come back. And I'm hoping that will also drive our rates down. So we anticipate next year will be a much better year for insurance rates and availability. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the rates are high because the availability is low. And Mm -hmm. I think I'm hoping Again, you know more than I do, but I'm hoping that as the insurance companies have left to like fill their coffers elsewhere, they will come back. Um, But so what where I think a lot of people make their mistake is they think that this is solely due to hurricane damage. It's not the hurricanes that bankrupt insurance companies. It's the insurance fraud. So that's what what I was getting. I'll give you. Yeah, so I'll give you an example. Let's just say your policy costs a thousand dollars. Okay, the actual insurance company is only on the hook for the first ten percent of the loss, the first hundred dollars. The reinsurers are on the hook for the other ninety percent, nine hundred dollars. So insurance carriers and reinsurers can somewhat budget for hurricanes. All right, it's the the rampant fraud that they can't budget for, where those roofs, you know, roofers are are you know putting in these frivolous roofing claims. And let's just say a shingle roof costs $15,000 to replace. They're submitting bills for $25,000, $30,000. It's just, it's been ridiculous. They can't rate for that. And they'd rather say, we're not going to do business here. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I was getting at is the rates aren't Mm -hmm. high because we have a thousand crazy hurricanes every year. They're partially, but mostly because of all that fraud that was going on where people were saying, hey, it's time for a new roof. Let's get you that, but blame it on that one hurricane from three or four years ago. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, that's good news. Uh, Anything else that our listeners should know about getting insurance in Florida, what it looks like now versus what this new legislation should be able to do for us? So in advance of that, I think if they're, if you're looking um, to purchase it, it's all about the roof, honestly, depending on the age of the home. Um, either if you're, if you're purchasing a home and the roof is over 15 years old, budget to put a new roof on it. Um, or the other things are metal roofs are fabulous. Insurance companies love it just from a pure insurance expense. Okay. If you find a house you love, you, you want it, buy it. But if you're looking at it from a nickels and dimes, how much is this going to cost? Um, and you're expensing for it. Um, it's all about the roof age. We can insure a 1925 home. Not, you know, it's not real expensive. It's how old is the existing roof on, on the home? And again, if it's greater than 15 years old, you're buying it just budget, hey, we're going to need to put a new roof on this. Unless it's metal. Metal does very, very well. Are there any other tips about like maybe potentially choosing a property that might yield better insurance rates, like age of the property, things like that? So uh, flood, flood insurance is a big thing you had brought up, you know, having a mortgage on a home. All of Florida is a flood zone. Um, there are some better than others. However, if you are in a high risk flood zone, and you have a mortgage on home, they're going to require you to carry flood insurance is get a quote for the flood cost. Um, and actually after, you know, the hurricane we had last year, there were a lot of homes that were in technically not a flood zone or an ex flood zone that you wouldn't be required to carry it. Many of them did not have flood insurance. And even though the flood was caused by the hurricane, their homeowner's insurance didn't respond. There were a lot of people with no coverage. 
And I find a lot of times investors, they won't buy it. They'll buy the bare minimum. You know, oh, I, I don't need it. I don't need it. But it's something, especially if you're generating income and you're dependent on that income, is even if you're not in a flood zone, look at purchasing a flood policy. And it's easy to get a flood quote. Agents can quote flood in a matter of a couple of minutes, determining what flood zone it is it's in and, you know, what the cost of a flood insurance will be. Yeah, I think that's also very important that a lot of people don't think about until they don't think about flood zones until they're well under contract. And then they're like, oh, wait, this is AE. And and then they realize that it's a little more. So watching the flood zones, age of roof and type of roof age of property, anything else we should watch for that maybe we should choose this property over that one in terms of insurance costs? The other, if it's if it's an older home, you want to look at has it had plumbing updates or prior claims. Um, maybe just do a little bit of research on the property. We found some where in Florida, if a home's more than 30 years old, the number one loss is water damage, water losses. And carriers are getting a little clever in that they're running all kinds of reports and history on the address on the owner that's purchasing it. Um, so looking for, you know, they're really looking if they're going to be a potential water loss. So if a home is older than 30 years, has it been replumbed? What kind of plum plumbing updates have happened to the property is huge as well. Um, because yeah, you can get a watered down cheap policy um, for older homes, but they might exclude water or they might only limit it to take, say $10,000 of coverage. So if you want a good solid policy, um, that's something to look at. Just pull the permits. It's easy to go to a county website and pull the permits on a home or do a four point inspection on the home before more than likely they're going to do that before they purchase it or ask the current owner, what kind of updates have been done, but those are huge. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, anything else related to insurance, John and Christina, that I'm not asking that you feel like the listeners would benefit from hearing? Sure. A, a couple, a couple additional things that, you know, I always tell my clients to keep an eye out for are concrete block construction versus a wood frame home. Um, obviously concrete block construction is a much more favorable uh, type of construction in Florida. Um, the shape of the roof, Jen, a hip roof versus a gable roof can mm -hmm. significantly impact insurance rates. Um, and, you know, one more thing that we touched on in a previous episode was the third nail or clips versus only having two nails and how we were able to save one of my clients $10,000 a year um, with that small $950 investment to add that third nail. Um, maybe you can comment on a couple of those things. Absolutely. Is it okay if I tag along and what you just said? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So one of the things on the older homes, um, in the past, when homes were built um, and they attached the trusses to the home, they would essentially use nails. Okay, not a bad idea where the wind blows could fly off. Well, as time has gone on, they've the Florida Building Code has improved. Um, and they it improved it by rather than just taking nails and attaching the trusses to the home, they have a metal clip with a strap and multiple nails in it. Therefore, the home the roof is going to perform better if the wind blows. Well, it's a pretty easy retrofit to do. Um, and like John said, he had a client and by upgrading, by adding these clips, you have these two big guys go in the attic, they spend the whole day there, they go trust by trust, and they add these hurricane clips to the trust. It cost about $950 to do it, but by upgrading from toenails to hurricane clips, um, it saved the client over $10,000 a year in, in insurance, which is huge. So a lot of times when the, the uh, pre-purchase inspections are done, they're doing a wind mitigation and a four-point inspection. On the wind mitigation, that will identify, does the home have toenails, does it have clips, or even better, single wraps or double wraps. But that's a huge way to save some money um, on the homeowner's insurance. And then the shape of the roof. Um, the more uh, angles the roof has, the better it'll fare in a storm. So if it has a hip roof credit, that is really good. The other thing is, is let's just say you've got a buyer that's um, buying the home and they admit it, know it and say, yep, I'm going to put a new roof on this house. Um, there's a, an additional thing they can do. It's called secondary water resistance barrier. Um, it's an additional upgrade that they're doing. And essentially they're putting a additional water barrier in between the plywood and the roof covering. And that's a really nice savings year over year as well. Some of our homeowner carriers now are requiring that secondary water resistance barrier. So it's a really nice thing to think about if you are having a roof, um, a roof updated on one of your properties or you're buying a home and you're going to replace the roof. Really important. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of, I wanted to discuss is if a person is purchasing the home, either in their individual name, maybe they're a first time buyer and they're like, oh, we're just going to buy this in our name and we're going to, you know, rent this out or are they putting it in an LLC. Um, super important if they're purchasing it in their individual name is make sure they have a personal umbrella policy um, just to kind of cover their exposure, especially if you've got short term rental renters in there, you really want to have the additional liability. Um, most dwelling policies. Um, will give a maximum of say 300, maybe 500,000 liability on a short-term renter's policy. So having the umbrella is huge. If you're putting it in an LLC, that is important. It's its own entity, but again, it, it, you know, not a bad idea to put additional excess liability on the property. Yeah, I typically recommend getting insurance. You know, the specific to short-term rentals, obviously not just mm -hmm. general. General homeowners insurance is not enough, but then also adding a commercial umbrella policy on top of that just to you know add another layer. Absolutely. Well, cool, uh, guys. Is there anything related to expenses overall that we haven't covered that you think our listeners would benefit from hearing? We cover most of it. Yeah, John covered most of it without me even having to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all right, guys. Thank He's you good all at so his much. Stuff. He knows his yeah. stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he got it done. Uh, well, guys, if you are ready to go ahead and jump into this market with John and Christina, you can email us at agents at the short term shop.com and we will get you connected. Uh, if you just want to learn more about short term rentals or maybe this market, there's a few ways you can do that. You can join our public Facebook group. It's called Short Term Rental Long Term Wealth, same title as my book. There's It's a community of 60,000 hosts and owners just sharing information and best practices. Or you can sign up to join one of our weekly live Q&As, and you can sign up for that at strquestions.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.